As you know, the RSU programme is funded um, through the EU. You'll have seen the flag out in the foyer. Um, the, through the LIFE platform. And at the Environmental Audit Committee meeting that happened in the, the summer that Steve mentioned this morning, um, it was highlighted as being one of the main ways that invasive species work gets funded across Europe. And we're lucky enough today to be joined by um, Per Arne, who's uh, worked on another LIFE project. He's come from Sweden, and he's going to tell us um, about the programme there to uh, control raccoon dogs. So Per Arne's a conservation biologist and has specialised in eradicating many species. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to give a talk here in, and I'm really keen on talking in Great Britain about your upcoming new predator because you will have this species quite soon. I will talk more about that later, but um, this is my absolutely favorite animal. I've been working with it for 15 years. <clears throat> and um, I will give short, uh, on, on this time, it would be a short, uh, overview of what we've done over, in, over the years. Uh, English is not my native tongue, so please bear with me, I will do my best. Uh, first, a little bit quick, what's uh, <laughs> left and right on, on a raccoon dog. Uh, it's uh, a semi-aquatic canine uh, predator, semi-aquatic fox almost, from um, that is um, native from uh, southeast and Asia. And the Russian, Rus Russian biologist put it out 9,100. They released in, in uh, the European part of former Soviet Union to increase fur production in nature. So it was not two animals jumping off a truck, it was 9,100. <coughs> and the population just increase and increase in Finland. All over Europe, here you can see the native range. Northern Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, China, Korea, Japan. And now it's exploding all over, all over Europe. And it's uh, going really fast. France, television from France is visiting us in a couple of months to see our um, methods because they are now in France. Um, so, uh, Sweden, Finland have had them for over 80 years, and we got the first one in 1947, we got the first, and then we've got these animals coming in from Finland all the time, but uh, it's been too uh, cold. This is native to Southeast Asia. It was too cold for them to reproduce. They reproduced, of course, but uh, the cubs didn't survive the winter. Until, but you might have noticed something has happened to the climate and it's getting warmer. So 2006 we could confirm reproduction and then it really started um, and, and they increased really fast. This is the, um, it's very highly reproductive. And um, I got the first mission from the Swedish EPA 2005 when I worked at the university to start to build a plan on what to do. And then it's been this, you all know it, working with invasive species, chasing money. Uh, but since 2008, we have had a steady, steady budget. And from 2008 and onwards, we started uh, hiring professional full-time hunters. We started develop methods. Uh, we started with the project service dogs to to produce, to train special service dogs, and they are one of the absolute key uh, keys to success in this, is these dogs. Uh, the Judas animals, uh, we stole the ID from goat eradications, and they, they have proven very, very important. And we started this citizen science reporting system that also is uh, very, very uh, important. And we also applied for and got a life project. Just a short notice on the Judas animals. We can follow them on the internet on a special page and we can see how they move about in all this country. And it is fantastic. And they cover enormous grounds. A single raccoon dog will walk 10 to 20 kilometers every night and has only one 
mission in its life to find a partner. And that's what we are using them for. So they detect other raccoon dogs for us. And as you see, here is one raccoon dog. And it covers about one million hectares a year. If I would hire a person to go about in one million hectare, it will cost a lot of money. And he or she will not know when she's in the vicinity of another raccoon dog. So it, it is fantastic. Uh, during three years, we had this life money. And then we got economically boosted so we could build an, um, <clears throat> a really good early warning system. And we have built this on both sides of the bordering river. We built it in Denmark, on southern Sweden, and on the possible immigration routes. And, and it's built up with trail camps and, and special lures that lures these uh, uh, animals in. And in this area, there is uh, not the possibility for a raccoon dog pair to have a home range without having at least one camera inside. So the life project where we can build up this infrastructure was very important. And these cameras, these professional hunters, together with these special trained service dogs, these dogs are, they, they, you can really, you get the picture from this surveillance system. And you can go there four or five hours later and release the dog on the same spot and it will go away in the darkness and disappear. And it can go one hour, two hour, but then three kilometers away, it, you can see on the GPS that now the dog has found this raccoon dog. They are fantastic. And, and they are, I mean, we are feeding a lot more brown bears than raccoon dogs, but they go around the moose and all the other wildlife just going to find this raccoon dog. These fantastic dogs. If these could have driving license, we <laughs> would have <coughs> very low budget. <laughs> yeah, the citizen science uh, uh, we have built up is now, in, when we started the, the early warning system with the cameras was of course the most important. Now it is the citizen science. Over 74% 74, 74 of every animal we take is uh, due to the citizen science system. Uh, to keep people reporting, we need an active media strategy. Here you can see when we're in the media, people are phoning. So. We need to be in media all the time. And we have a very active media strategy. We're in media at least three times a week. Since we started, 1,646 uh, articles written or recorded about us. So it, it is important. But one thing to bear in mind now when you have raccoon dogs in Great Britain, it is when people see stuff. This white tapir escaped from a zoo in Sweden. So they had the same problem as us. They needed media to get the attention of the people. So they went out in media, help us, we have this white tapir. So the first day it was cited 100 times. During 80 days it was cited over two counties, <laughs> plenty. And after 80 days, my, my uh, hunting friend was the veterinary at that zoo at that moment. They found it drowned. It has never been outside of the zoo. So it is 200 kilos, it's completely white, and it has an elephant trunk. <coughs> and it, people are so very helpful. <laughs> Raccoon dogs, you, even my full-time staff that's been working for me 10 years, they can't tell a badger and a raccoon dog apart if it goes away from you. When it comes to, uh, if you see a bird, you need to contact the ornithologist. If you see a strange beetle, you need to contact the entolomist. Sorry. But if you see a mammal, every single person is a taxonomist and know <laughs> this. So it's, it's, it's very difficult with, with uh, mammals. Here you can see a normal year. Here, between 600 and 1,000 reports of raccoon dogs in Sweden. We visit in fields, we put cameras out, and here is where we can find them. <laughs> and this goes every year, every year. So bear that in mind when you start chasing raccoon dogs in Great Britain. <laughs> uh, because badgers is, of course, the most, here is what it is when we find out what it is. Badger, fox, cat, marten, otter, farm fox, deer, I, I mean, it's everything. We even created a DNA tool 
So if, because raccoon dog makes latrines. So if you find the latrine, you can send some of the shit in. And we put it in our DNA machine and out comes that it, yes, it was a red fox and it was a uh, house cat and two human feces has been sent to us. <laughs> it is amazing. Uh, but the life project was very successful given that all countries that was involved is continuing with the management. And we have the same reference group and it's still intact. And that reference group, we meet two times a year and we share the methods that we have gotten to work. And, and um, for example, Denmark has, there's a good message for you when you started with raccoon dogs in Great Britain, cheese. They are very, very fond of cheese. So we are starting, when we bait them, you use cheese and yeah, so on. It, it is, it's a very good. Um, some of the results from Sweden then, um, we, have, we have had a very great success. The population is, uh, you can't measure it in nature anymore, and, and um, we have taken the population really down. In Finland, it's been very good, work with the same methods. Denmark has taken the odd decision to do management of a nocturnal mammalian predator during office hours. <coughs> so. And they, they, it's increasing exponentially, and this 2019, they killed about 7,000, and, and, and it will hit the, it, it's a lost case. Sweden, the two different um, way we measure the two uh, population monitoring systems shows this um, for us, they, they are gone, almost. Uh, if you, Sweden is almost twice the size of Great Britain. So if you cut Sweden here, you have the size of Great Britain here. So when we started, we were chasing this reproducing population on an area the size of Great Britain. And we have taken it from south and north. And here you see that today, 10 years ago, we were fighting reproductions on Swedish soils. Today, we are handling individuals immigrating from Finland. So it is a much, much better. Yeah. But that also gives challenge. The Judas animals is one of our most important co-workers. So this will be now the fourth year that I'm buying captive raccoon dogs from Finnish fur farms. Because I cannot recruit the amount of Judas animals I need. I need 20 to 30 all the time. So now I buy, every year I buy captive, completely tame raccoon dogs, sterilize them, put radio collars on them, and release them in the nature, because we need to have this amount of Judas animals to detect when there is a new in, uh, immigrating individual from Finland. And, and um, it's very interesting. They are completely tame. They've lived in a size cage like this. You release them in nature. One, two weeks after that, they are as wild as an, any other. They move as a wild one. They, and considering the amount of raccoon dogs that are escaping in Great Britain, if you don't catch them the first one or two weeks, they are wild. And you can see that they also search for um, partners. So they work uh, exactly. After give them one or two weeks, they will be exactly as another raccoon dog except the white ones, they are gone too long in the domestic process, so that they, they seem to never get wild. So we've stopped using the white ones. So what we've actually been doing is that we've cut the branch off. So we saw this happening and started negotiating with the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, because now, when there is almost no raccoon dogs left, why should the government put so much money then I will need to sell to my staff that you have done such a fantastic job, so half of you will get fired. <laughs> so we started already here. 2015, we started renting out, because the raccoon dog is hibernating. So December to March, we can rent our staff out to conservation eradications in the tropics. So we've done uh, two, one, one in 2015 and uh, one in 2017 we have rented staff out to the Seychelles to eradicate the, the, this um, 
uh, Indian mina, the, one of the world's most uh, invasive bird species. So that's a good thing, but um, so to keep the staff. Uh, 2017, the EPA, the government, gave us the mission to eradicate the muskrats from Sweden. And muskrats is strange because we've had them in well, very big areas, almost half of Sweden since 1960, but they are functionally extinct now due to some pathogen. They are extinct in the whole of Finland and half of Baltic countries. Some pathogen has taken them. But the population, uh, the leading scientist on muskrat says that they will never reach southern Sweden because this high coastal alpine area, and he was almost right. It took them 25 years to cross these nine kilometers, but they are there now, and we have got the mission to eradicate them. And we are working quite intensively with that, and we have had a great success. Uh, I hope they will be gone with this year or next year. Uh, we also, 2018, we got the mission to start shooting all these uh, uh, hybrid falcons that uh, the falconer in, that are escaping from falconers. There is, this is a hybrid between American prairie falcon and European peregrine falcon that is uh, nesting with Swedish uh, peregrine falcon and genetically polluting uh, our uh, native peregrine falcon. So from 2018 and onwards, they don't uh, live so long. Uh, 2019, last year, we started with Egyptian goose. And uh, here we have only had one known reproduction of Egyptian goose in Sweden. So we're, as this uh, curve has been up some during the day, we are really early here, so at very good time. And this is a fantastic cooperation with BirdLife Sweden and the Twitcher Club, Club 300. As soon as one of these birds lands in Sweden, the ornithologists, they throw themselves on the phone and my phone goes hot. There is a... Egyptian goose here, come and shoot it. And if it's not dead within two or three days, they are, where are you guys? It's still here. So since 2019, as soon as the Egyptian goose lands, the bird watcher phones us and we go there and help them onwards in their incarnations. So it is, um, that one is also dead now. It, we got the mission to take out the freshwater turtles. They are listed. Uh, so we started this work uh, last year, and it's very interesting. And they are, together with the Swedish Society for Herptology, they send in the report. Here they are, go and kill them. And, and we go and kill them. And um, it is really interesting um, work and strange kind of traps, but they are highly reproductive. The females are very good conditions and full of eggs. So considering if we are thinking that the climate will continue to get warmer, it's a good idea to take these out before they start reproducing too much. Lessons learned. Active media, very important. Horizon scanning of the pet trade. We can see on the pet trade on the internet what kind of invasive species. I can already now tell you that we will be fighting skunks in Europe because they are increasingly popular as pets. And exotic squirrels we also have in Sweden, but then the government sends us out. And yeah, sorry to say, we, uh, that is also onwards in the incarnation. We take them, just two days ago we took another one. They are escape, escape pets. Uh, here is uh, six months' worth of escaped raccoon dogs in Great Britain. I'm a very silent member of two Facebook groups from Great Britain keeping raccoon dogs as pets. And when they escaped, they put the picture out and said, help me, my raccoon dog has escaped. And there is not many of them that they actually catch. <laughs> so you have here a founder population. So I, I suggest that you start doing something about it. Uh, how can we be sure that we have no raccoon? How, what is time? OK. Um, people always ask me, how, how um, can we be sure that there is no? Because we, there are thousands of sightings of raccoon dogs in southern Sweden. And we only have the cameras up there. 
Well, we have 200,000 hunting dogs in Sweden. If they will be reproducing raccoon dogs in southern Sweden, some of these dogs will take one of the, of the young ones because they can't escape a dog. Uh, they have the black belt in getting road killed. So there would be road killed raccoon dogs on the road if there was reproducing population. But maybe the most important, we have 100,000 private trail camps owned by the hunters that are aimed towards, for raccoon dogs, very good food. So if there was raccoon dogs in southern Sweden, they will get their picture taken. And here you can see our camera surveillance area. And here is the pictures we get from hunters' trail camps every year. Is this a raccoon dog? And we politely say, thank you for the picture. This is a badger. Keep sending us the pictures. Here is a typical example. A hunter sends a picture in southern Sweden, please come and take this raccoon dog. And we answer, thank you, that's not a raccoon dog, it's a raccoon dog, but it, it's a raccoon, not a raccoon dog. But we have the responsibility to take that anyway, so we got and took it. Um, so key to success, funding. Don't start anything like this if you don't have the funding. The bad name in con conservation on fighting invasive species is when you start doing something with too little funding. And the end will just be the politicians will say, it's worthless doing stuff like that because it costs huge much upon money and it doesn't give the result. So funding is very important. Unlimited land access. There is no landowner in Sweden that can say no to us. That is very important. We have, it says in our, in, our permit, in, in our permit from the government, we have to tell the landowner afterwards we've done something. So that's very good. And if you don't have it, I mean, you couldn't do stuff like this if you would need to ask the landowners. If you release a dog in the middle of the night and it starts barking four kilometers away and you go there and it's a raccoon dog, three o'clock in the morning, there is no, how, how could you even know who owns the land? It can take three or four days to know who, who has the, the tiles on this. I mean, it's impossible. Dedicated staff. Michael, he married. He's in the bed on his wedding night when the picture comes from this surveillance <laughs> that camera 34, there is a raccoon dog. He takes his service dog and he goes. Dedicated staff. <laughs> so, I will finish. We started up with a budget on 8 million, so we, uh, 800,000 euros a year to do management on one species. And we have now got the race in budget, 1.3, so I'm actually hiring staff now. So from, from this year and onwards, we have a budget on 1.3 million euros, and our responsibility is every invasive mammal, bird, and freshwater turtles in Sweden. So we have multi-species management that really, so the cost per species has gone down tremendously. And I will finish by saying we are quite proud that we won one of the prizes as one of the best top 10 uh, conservation projects in Europe um, when we did our live project. And thank you for listening.